Nintendo is awesome. Starting out way back in 1889, yeah, Japan was so advanced that they already made video games back then. Just kidding. It started out as a Hanafuda or flower gaming card company. What are these Hanafuda cards, you ask? Kind of like our own normal card deck, except with flowers. Kind of like that onigiri is Japan's sandwich, Hanafuda cards are their variant of cards. Anyway, in the 1970s, Nintendo started going electronic, and before you knew it, became a powerhouse of gaming innovation, and digital goodness known the world over. Characters like Mario, Luigi, Donkey Kong are household names, and it has collected an esteemed collection of well-loved characters and stories under its roof. So what crazy idea did some loser by the name of Masahiro Sakurai under the development company HAL Labs think of? A game where the most popular Nintendo characters duke it out on a highly addicting fighting game of pure solid goodness. wouldn't be accepted, Sakurai pitched the demo to them anyway, because he's obviously not a loser. And wouldn't you know it, Nintendo must have some really great people working there because they accepted it and, when it was finished, it quickly rose to fame and became a staple in Nintendo series itself. Something's gone wrong in the happy-go-lucky world of Nintendo. Introducing Super Smash Brothers, where all your favorite characters go toe-to-toe -to -toe in one four-player star-studded slam fest, only on Nintendo 64. The first title was released in 1999, and guess who joined the roster of playable characters? Why, Pikachu, of course! And a hidden Jigglypuff to boot! Both could be set against the likes of Samus, Captain Falcon, or Fox McCloud in a never-ending fight to get the other knocked square out of the playing field. The game's fast-paced, energetic style kept interest and enjoyability at a high rate in which you never wanted to stop. I love how off the wall this was made, and you can tell it was fun for the designers because there were many secrets and nods to each game, and the art style was fluid and awesome. And even the very concept is nuts! In a very good way. The game had Saffron City as a playing field, which was of course Pokemon's very own Saffron City, and it had a bunch of Pokemon popping up from the area and giving you a hard time. Like that Charmander! I mean Charmander. What the crap is a Charmander doing on a roof of a building? And why is this thing so threatening? Never mind. Another great feature was that each character could shift colors so you can distinguish the player's choice. Better than just having a random hue. Later in 2001, with the advent of the successor of the N64, one of the GameCube's debut titles was Super Smash Bros. sequel. Super Smash Bros. And to this day, it's still one of the best in the GameCube's library. I actually bought a cube solely to play this on. If the two Smash Brothers games were cars, Super Smash Brothers Melee would be the limo hummer compared to the first one's Volkswagen bug. The game was ex supremely expanded, far better looking, more fluid, more enjoyable, and contained a Fort Knox sized stash of secret characters, trivia, collectible trophies, and game modes. The first Smash Brothers had a total of 12 playable characters. Melee had more than double! In addition to Jigglypuff and Pikachu, there was also Pikachu's next-gen pre-evolution. Pikachu! Aw, cute. But it was kind of a clone of Pikachu. Well, with almost the same moves and movements, except it was faster, and hurt itself when attacking. And another cutesy Pokemon with... Oh yeah, it wasn't a cutesy poo Pokemon this time. In a very surprising turn of events, a totally hideously evil, ugly Pokemon called Mewtwo, of all the other actually popular Pokemon, became a playable character, much to my disbelief and exuberant joy. <laughs> With Melee, there were modes upon modes of challenges and fights, high energy, comic style, and addictive as always. So many areas to battle and so many combatants. I always picked either Mewtwo or Bowser. Yes, I realize both are low tires, and if you knew enough, they could very well make you feel good about your love for them. In the game, special items would fall from the sky to be used against the opponent. 
The cool thing about it is that they were items from other Nintendo games and products. Well, this was in the first one, but such as the mushroom from Mario, the old NES laser gun, and Pokeballs. The cool thing about Pokeballs is that they do exactly what they should do. Release a random Pokemon to deliver extra damage. And my word, I cannot believe how much stuff was crammed into such a small disc. Almost 30 different Pokemon could come out of the Pokeball. Some were useless, like Goldeen, and some made everyone crap their pants in fear. There were two Pokemon-based levels in the game. Saffron didn't return, but we had Pokemon Stadium, a living arena in Kanto that would change texture. I kind of wish it would have stayed the same. I like plastic arenas. But then there was the infamous Poke Floats, which I think is the lamest place to fight. You know, it's just a bunch of Pokemon Stadium models pretending to be giant balloons. Kind of stupid. But hey, it's still Pokemon, and it didn't hurt the game at all. Despite coming out three years after the original Smash Brothers, Melee's sequel would have us waiting for seven. Super Smash Brothers Brawl finally exploded onto shelves for the Nintendo Wii in March 2008. And it was Super Smash Brothers more or less perfected. I know many of us play these in real tournaments, and I'm not totally knowledgeable in this. However, in were many, many new characters, and out were a few. The gameplay was still the same, but slightly tweaked and improved. Still very addicting. Nintendo is awesome for many reasons, and one of them is to be able to plug in your old GameCube controller into this system, giving us the power to unleash our brawling skills the way we were meant to unleash it. Even more secrets and items were available in the game, while in my opinion not as revolutionary as Melee, had more Pokemon characters. In addition to Pikachu and Jigglypuff, the Pokemon Trainer, Red from Generation 3 revamp, with three playable Pokemon, Charizard, Ivysaur, and Squidow, entered the arena. Mewtwo was back, except he's blue, and has shorts. Wait, who's that? Oh yeah, Mewtwo was replaced by some sort of creature called Luc... Luc... Lucaprio... Lu sorry, Lucario. Anyway, jokes aside, because I don't want to get barbecued, Mewtwo was intended to be in the game until it was agreed that there were too many good Pokemon in Brawl, Generation 1. So, to further create awareness and advertise the Diamond and Pearl games, they took out Mewtwo, made him more agile and sturdy, and changed his appearance and replaced it with Lucario. Because if it was Mewtwo, the game would have exploded when played due to too much perfection. Sorry. Jokes aside, to have known that Mewtwo was taken out only because there were too many Gen 1 Pokemon in the game says a lot about the coolness of Masahiro Sakurai. And yeah, I was upset that Mewtwo wasn't in Brawl, but the reasons he was taken out makes perfect sense. So anyway, listing the improvements to the new game would be a massive video in itself, but I will say that the characters were able to catch a little glowy rainbowy orb and perform the ultimate smash move. Dangerous. The future of Super Smash Bros. is not too certain. Brawl is insane, and there won't be a shortage of players. However, I hope you enjoyed this little insight on Super Smash Bros. concerning Pokémon. <laughs> See you next time.